everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Kevin Belk, and I'm very excited today that we have the director of Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, Joel Crawford, and Harvey Guillen, who voices the role of Perito. Welcome, guys. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Hey. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for joining. I'm very, very excited to have you both. Uh, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish uh, is a uh, the sequel to the 2011 DreamWorks hit film Puss in Boots, uh, which was a spinoff, of course, inspired from the world of the beloved Shrek franchise. Um, and Puss in Boots, The Last Wish releases on December 21st, just before the holidays. So very, very excited to have you two talk about the film. Um, so Joel, we'll start with you. You know, you directed uh, The Crudes, A New Age for DreamWorks uh, just a few years ago, and now this is kind of your second directing gig. And so what drew you to the story, uh, to con the continued adventures of Puss in Boots? Um, you know, there was, it's, it's one of those movies that, um, I've been at DreamWorks for like over 17 years, started as a storyboard artist. And, um, we were always going, when are they going to make the next Puss in Boots movie? Just because it was like, you, you love these characters and like root for their return, um, to the big screen. And, uh, when I finished Crude's A New Age, there was this opportunity. The studio has been trying to figure out the right next story. You know, they, they didn't want to just make one just to make one. They were like, what's the right story? And this nugget of an idea where Puss is on the last of his nine lives was there was something so magic in that because it's it's absurd. It's a fairy tale. It's like we, this idea of cats have nine lives is so ridiculous. But then at the heart of it was this, this thing of, Puss has one life. We as humans just get one life. And I thought this is a great opportunity to tell a story that's funny, that's exciting. It's a return to the Shrek world. But then at its heart has this beautiful message about celebrating the life we all have. And I thought that we have to do this now. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's it's just a beautiful story, and I love kind of the arc of it and and where it goes and, and kind of lessons it teaches us in the end. Um, and, you know, what did you learn from when you worked on Cruise as kind of your first directing gig, and even from your storyboarding world uh, years, what did you learn from that that you were able to apply for, uh, to this as, as a director? I think I, I learned that making movies is really hard and that there's this, there's this kind of magic when you when you're – creating especially like an animated movie because you start with nothing you start there's there's no set there's uh, you're figuring out the script together and it's almost like improv and i've always loved like like improv i used to uh, take groundlings improv classes when i was at um at art school i was just like so in, enthralled with it and um because it's like you start with nothing and then there's this yes and this this building that by the end of the process it's way more beautiful than what you kind of set out to do. And I really discovered that on Crudes where the, you know, cause we, we bring in talented people like Harvey and we have a script for them and we say, let's, let's um, you know, I give you context for the scene and they'd record the lines and they're amazing actors, but they, what I discovered is can be amazing partners in creating the story and creating su surprising ourselves. And that's something that I fully like embraced in this where Harvey has been an amazing <laughs> partner on, on this movie of um, not just delivering the voice of Perito, but like finding the heart of this character. And I think that ends up being what's on screen is this, this, um, this spontaneous kind of dynamic between the characters that carries the theme, but not in a like heavy handed way. Yeah. And that's credit to the director, you know, because it, it makes the environment that we're in feel free to explore together. You know, you get a project sometimes and it's like, that's not the line or like, you know, the, you have to stick to the script. Mm -hmm. And when you collaborate, like you said, with someone, that's such a nice word because that is true. You are collaborating, you know, with someone and they want to make this the best it can be. And to do that, we should be able to talk and listen to each other and be like, I have an idea or how about this? Or it was just having that freedom in the room that, you know, it was you presented that because it was just like, yeah, just have fun with it. And then when you do something that you thought, oh, I'm never going to use this, but I'm going to say it at the end of my, you know, line as a fun joke and then saying, that's good, you know, <laughs> do that. And it's just like, oh, oh, I was just saying it for fun. You know, it's like, yeah, do that. It's like, okay. And then you change or tweak the line a little bit. It's still in the same world, but it's, uh, it just makes it more organic, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, but I'd say there's also uh, this layer of trust that like, I, I'm saying, let's try a bunch of these lines and you're just 
freely trying a bunch of things. Some you may think are, yeah, that's the one. That's great. Or other ones of like, please don't use that. Line. Like, don't use that. Um, but that you would trust me to go, I'm going to take it to editorial and figure out when I'm cutting the different voices together, what's what's the right dynamic. Yeah. And, and so and how to put that together and make it linear and cohesive. And, and again, it's just like the yes and rule, you know, it's just like, try like this. I'm like, I don't see how that, all right. Yes. And, you know, just like, <laughs> and you do it, but then it's because, you know, you have a vision already. And so when the director has that vision, obviously you follow it through. That's why they're the director. And it's, when you see the final product, you're like, you never question anything because the film is so phenomenal and fantastic and you did an amazing job directing it. So it's, Aww, it's, an, honor. it's an honor to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, I mean, it comes through on screen. It's, it's so much fun. And Harvey, you know, looking at uh, Perito, um, he's so innocent and funny and he brings a balance, I think, to the film a little bit because he is like, particularly with the dynamics between the trio of them with like Puss and Kitty and, and, and his character. And so obviously, you know, I'm sure a lot of that was obviously what you're talking about in the script. And, but can you tell me what your first impressions were of the character and then how you shaped the character in that recording booth and kind of what you brought to it to, to bring it to screen? Yeah, I just remember auditioning for it and we had a Zoom meeting and then it was just an honor to be asked to to audition, you know, for this because I was like, I grew up watching, you know, Shrek and Puss in Boots. And so to be even asked, I was like, I can't believe it. I got an invitation to, you know, the mall. <laughs> on, uh, on our side, uh, we were like, we we're like, we can't believe it. Harvey's going to audition for us. <laughs> we were such fans of what we do in the shadows and, and the character were like, and I was so nervous. So I was just like, oh, I hope I do a good job. And then they broke the ice and they were like, first of all, we're really big fans of what we do in the shadows. <laughs> And I was like, okay, good. That's on my side. Okay, good. That's good. And then, you know, so you do the voice because sometimes for the most part, when you do voiceover, they kind of just want your voice in general. They're like, just you as a talk, you know, as you're talking out. But with Perrito, I really wanted to find that voice for him because uh, he is, you know, full of life. He's so optimistic and he's so, uh, you know, he has so much heart. And so uh, I just felt like his his register was higher and we found him to be an octave higher than my speaking voice in a, in a way, but it's so welcoming because in that register, I feel Perito makes you feel, even though he might annoy you for a second, it's like, oh, that voice is so full of energy. It makes me like, because we're so <laughs> cynical in the world sometimes, you know, we like, we think that someone who sounds like that is just like, oh, but it, we need that kind of personality around us. We need someone to be our biggest supporter, our biggest cheerleader. And then we found out with Porrita. I remember, I remember doing the scene with you in the room when I'm talking to Puss. And it's like giving him that opportunity with the last wish and, and describing to me like, it's okay. You know, it's like, I know your wish was really important to you. And sometimes the life you have, you know, in front of you. It's like a sweet moment that I was like, when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, I totally get this character. It's so sweet. And we need this. Like, we definitely need this, especially, you know, where we are now in the world. But I think like like that example of like this, the the dog's character, you know, he, he carries so much. There's so much comedy with him in the movie, but he also carries the theme of the movie about, you know, you, you, this is a story about all these kind of larger in life characters, they're all cynical, they're all chasing after this one wish that they think is gonna fix their lives. And you got this, this like charming little dog who doesn't want anything. He wants no wish. He just appreciates who's around him. And you constantly found this way of delivering the lines to where there, there's, no, there's, there's no part of it that's like um, looking down on anyone mm -hmm. when you're saying these things. It's, it's almost like you're full of this wisdom, but don't know you're spouting wisdom. Right. And that was like such a beautiful like line to, to tread that, that you found. Well, thank you. I, I really did enjoy playing this character so much. And like you said, finding those like colors with him because he's so such an optimist, you know, he's like everything's the, the world's your oyster and, and friendship is all that matters and your family and friends and all of that. And I just remember thinking this is such a great message for kids and not just for kids, but also for families right now and in, in, in the world we live in. And in just that moment, I remember it's hard to do comedy, but it's hard to find comedy with heart. You know, and that's even harder because, you know, a joke is a setup and a joke can be set up in its rhythm and it's like how you set it up. But a joke that's set up and has heart and a message behind it is so layered into like a nice flaky croissant that you just have to like peel mm -hmm. away. And, and I know, right? It's just, <laughs> <laughs> and this interview's over. We're off to get breakfast. <laughs> but, I mean, actually, that's so interesting. I haven't thought about this until you said it right now, but the when we were trying to figure out the placement of the characters in this story uh the because like you said like it's you're used to like jokes and setups um in a weird way the the placement of the dog in this story is a joke in a setup 
with the heart to it. Mm. We we originally the co-director and I, Daniel Mercado, are huge fans of Sergio Leone's spaghetti westerns. And for us, a big template in this was the good, the bad, and the ugly, where mm -hmm. you got all these characters after that that treasure. Um, and the only character that almost didn't fit in that wa was the dog. Rico, yeah. And and so it was this kind of charming thing where like that's the joke is like, why is this guy on the journey? <laughs> and and but but the 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 payoff of that is wow, this guy changed the journey. By the end of it, his influence around all these characters changes it. And so it's it's not only the comedy is built into the heart. And so when you found that character, it just carries it organically through the story. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> and, and, um, and Joel, I really want to talk about, um, and so I'm a huge, you know, uh, love of animation and have been my entire life and studied it. And what I love about it is the art style and designs of this film. And, you know, I've seen it with bad guys that DreamWorks had done. And now with the new DreamWorks had an opening that's going to, you know, uh, show in front of the new film. And now this, and really, you are really pushing boundaries here with not even just, just set background designs and character designs and animation styles, but timing of things as well. And so what I love is, you know, mainstream and you know animation over the last you know few decades have always been pushing kind of photorealism it seems like with animated characters within it and now you it seems like dreamworks and you have now taken a different step of saying like let's get artsy with this let's bring a map paint into life and what i couldn't believe was not even just in the character designs and the clothing that they were wearing everything it was also in special effects but also the animation style where you know instead of this getting a little technical, but instead of animating very smoothly, some of the action sequences were animated. I saw almost like in block stepped animation where it's on like twos, threes, and fours, and you're kind of playing with that. So can you talk about just not the design of the world, but also the animation choices and uh, that you that you made that in the film? Absolutely. The it's it's cool because right now, you know, animation is mainstream animation is kind of breaking free of, like you're saying, the constraints of what people think it should be. That I mean, there's this idea that that these movies are for kids only, and and being able to push that to um, go no, these movies we can tackle subjects that are beyond you know that that are for everybody. Um, the the ability to break free from the classic kind of CG look, like you're saying, go, it doesn't have to strive for photorealism. I mean, we're creating imaginative worlds here, and being able to combine like um, the the kind of a handheld hand uh implemented brush stroke to this movie was awesome because um it's and i can't take the credit the production designer nate rag really kind of spearheaded like what this could look like um but the we want to make sure as we're pushing stuff that it all leads back to the story we're telling and so we wanted a, a like kind of a concept be behind why we're doing what we're doing. And for the the look of it, um, this idea was Puss is in this fairy tale kind of mindset. I'm gonna live forever. And this this idea of cats have nine lives, like this, this thing that feels like, yes, it's a fairy tale. And it's amazing to be able to drop the audience into that uh, from the very beginning with this painterly style. But something else was really great about it too, is like you can see the brush strokes on like Puss's hat or um, even like Perito's fur, it's like you can, it looks like brush strokes that are making up his fur, that there's something tangible about it. There's something that, you know, the computers make things perfect and they, but they can also reduce the, the human touch. And in this story, we're telling about feeling and embracing the moments and, and seeing what's around you. Like, it's amazing to be able to see a tangible kind of environment. Um, and then on the animation side, we wanted to use that same concept. So the Ludo Buon show, um, the head of character animation, really crafted this philosophy of um, when, you know, we're, Puss is in this fantastical kind of, he's larger than life. Every, every action scene feels, it doesn't feel grounded in reality. It feels like turned up, like, and using stepped animation, like you're saying, holding images for, you know, two frames, three frames, instead of being smooth and everything's one frame, it allows for you to feel like 
this isn't real life. This is cooler than real life. And um, so we purposely used it in moments during like action scenes where Puss is almost disconnected from the grounded reality. Um, and then in scenes where, you know, he's sharing a moment with, with Perito and these moments of vulnerability, we go to everything being on ones. And so you have these, these, this contrast that's just subtly, you know, in and out throughout the movie. Yeah, I love that you have a set rules for that as well in terms of, and it, it, it was very notable. Like it, it was, it was really, really cool to see. And it kind of made me perk up a little bit when I got to scenes <laughs> that were messing with the animation timing a little bit. I was like, what? You know, and, and I even <laughs> think if kids or adults, when they're watching it, um, I think even though they may not understand that kind of technicality of, of animation, will it, it ignites something in your brain where you're, yeah. you're looking if at it, something. If it goes with the story, different. you just feel it. You don't have to understand even technically what, why and what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. Um, Harvey, as I said, a uh, huge fan of, you know, I got introduced to you from, you know, what we do in the shadows. And uh, but I what I love from also just reading about your life story, and it's so inspirational about how you came into acting. And I know you had talked about a bit about Annie was one of the first films you saw as a child and inspired you to become an actor. So I won't make you repeat that. Anyone who wants to look that up can look up Harvey Game, Annie, and you can get the full story there. It's amazing <laughs> and, and hilarious how you tell it. But but now, you know, now that you've become an actor, you've become an accomplished actor, you're you're blowing up, you're coming into more and more things. When you were at such a young age and you decided that and you you kind of grew into the actor that now you've become, which films, TV shows, and actors do you remember as a child and even kind of in your teens and now in your adulthood that you remember that inspired you to become the actor that you are and that you got, got your sense of comedic timing? I mean, <clears throat> I was like an old soul growing up because I would watch like old black and white movies with my dad in Spanish, like Cantinflas, which was like very good physical comedy. He's a Mexican film actor. Um, so Cantinflas was a huge part of my childhood and also moved on to like stuff later on, like, um, you know, Paper Moon. Uh, and that was a big one, uh, which I shouldn't have been watching like that, <laughs> that, <laughs> at that age. And then also I remember like in freshman year of high school, like, you know, watching um, Peter Jackson's Heavenly Creatures with Kate Winslet and Melly Linsky. And I thought they were so cool. And I went down a rabbit hole of like, who are these actresses? And they're 16 and 17 year old actresses and not that much older, um, you know, in that, you know, time they played. And I was like, wow, they're so good. And like, I want to be that good. I want to be that good. And I just recently got to meet Melly Linsky uh, at an event and she came up. She's like, oh my gosh, she was a Swedish. She's like, I'm such a fan of what we do in the shadows. And I was like, I was watching you <laughs> growing up and I was just idolizing, you know, um, yeah, I was just drawn to a lot of uh, strong, you know, female leads and like just uh, the vulnerability and of course like the Meryl Streep and and whatnot. But for comedy, I think it was like Cantinflas and El Chavo del Ocho, which I grew up watching. So for my physical comedy, that's where I kind of drew from um, inspiration. And then for real layer nuances and whatnot, it was a like female uh, leads <laughs> that I looked at. And, and that, that's amazing. And Joel, how about you in terms of what inspired you growing up? What films did you watch and TV shows that inspired you to become a storyboard artist? And then, you know, ultimately your directing style that you landed on. Yeah, because um, growing up, I I knew I like wanted to be kind of one of two things. One was an artist. The other one was a stuntman. I, I was like, I'm going to be a stuntman when I grow up. I see that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the safer route doing this. <laughs> but so I, I, I loved watching uh, the show Fall Guy. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that, that there was, I loved action. Um, but like I was saying early on, like I discovered um, Akira Kurosawa movies, like Seven Samurai and Your Jimbo, and, and was like, I mean, they were just these big, kind of vistas and these these huge kind of larger than life characters and then there was underneath his movies there's this there's this humanity this depth that um was like the reason I watched him because I was like samurais but then it, like you're surprised by the 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 warmth underneath it um and then later discovered Sergio Leone and like um and I mean um let me say also, I love like Dumb and Dumber, like <laughs> like Step Brothers. I have this weird kind of mashup of things that like the, the co-director, Daniel Mercado and myself will like, as we're talking about like, hey, what if this scene and, and we'll fluctuate between like Kurosawa and then like, yeah, Step Brothers. And like, <laughs> so it's a, it's a weird kind of, uh, yeah, weird 
combining of, of different things. But, um, you know, I think those, those influences where I love to laugh and I love coming into something with, it's like the, the spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. It's like, I want to be entertained and then be surprised by, by the, the heart of it, you know? It's a nice buffet of it all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're really hungry. We're really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we need to wrap, but I absolutely love the film. I loved speaking with both of you. Um, I love the design of the film. I love the story. I love seeing Puss in Boots again. I love the new characters of Burrito and and uh, Goldilocks and Three Bears and just the voice casting is so wonderful. So, um, Joel, I love your work. My kids love your work. You know, we're very, very huge fans of kind of what DreamWorks is doing now and, and pushing the art styles and, uh, and cool. storytelling. And yeah, it's it's very, very cool. Because again, it was part of my childhood too. So to see these characters come back and and um, come back into, you know, the mainstream and stuff. And uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. You. So yeah, we love it. And Harvey, I love you. As I said, for the 10th time, I love you so much. I want to see you in everything. So let this be a note to movie and TV cast. Casting world, we need more Harvey in our cinema. More Harvey, please. more Harvey, please. So, uh, thank Puss you. Boots, the last, of course, Puss and Boots, the last wish, uh, releases December twenty first, just before the holidays. Uh, please go see it, and thank you both again for your time. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.